Lamar, having seen the Minneapolis Lakers move out to Los Angeles and keep their name, was originally very, very determined that the team would keep its nickname and therefore be the Kansas City Texans. To his credit, Lamar's general manager, Jack Stedman, uh, who was not really a football guy, was more of a business guy, an oil guy, did have the good sense to somewhat sternly and somewhat stubbornly tell Lamar, you cannot move a franchise to Kansas City, Missouri, and call it the Kansas City Texans. So they, they had a newspaper name that team contest, and uh, the Kansas City Chiefs became the, the new nickname for the franchise. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hi there, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is Tim Hanlon, and this is indeed Good Seats Still Available, the podcast that is curious in its uh, search for stories and insights and all kinds of fun stuff around teams and leagues that uh, don't exist anymore for whatever reasons we pursue such. Thank you again for joining us, and we're in for a treat today. My uh, guest is author extraordinaire, sports uh, historian, if you will, Michael McCambridge. We are going to be talking about Lamar Hunt, the patron saint of the uh, old American Football League, the AFL, a major contributor to the modern-day NFL that we know and love and and enjoy today, and uh, his uh, books about Lamar and as well as just the history of, uh, of American football are both extremely relevant and uh, very relevatory, as you'll see in a couple of minutes when we uh, get into our conversation with Michael. Michael McCambridge has got a, a, a breadth of, of stuff out there, but uh, there are two books in particular that I encourage uh, my listeners to get copies of and devour as I have. Lamar Hunt, A Life in Sports, which came out in 2012, which was the original impetus of my reach out to Michael. But back in uh, 2004, uh, Michael also authored the book called America's Game, the epic story of how pro football captured a nation. You're going to hear both books basically referenced uh, in today's chat. For those completists out there who uh, want to delve even deeper uh, into the story of both the AFL and Lamar Hunt, obviously those stories uh, quite intertwined. I highly encourage both of those books. Now, uh, for those sports historians out there who are uh, especially persnickety, uh, you know that Lamar Hunt was not just confined to AFL football but also things like professional soccer, the evolution of Major League Soccer would not be made possible without uh, Lamar Hunt's past exploits. And in particular, uh, his yeoman-like work with the uh, Dallas Tornado and the original North American Soccer League. My hope is to get Michael back for a conversation around that particular part of Lamar Hunt's history and background. Uh, But for today, uh, it's the AFL and the Kansas City Chiefs, which you know, really didn't start as the Kansas City Chiefs. And the beginning part of this interview got uh, snipped off a little bit uh, by some technical glitch. But I started off our conversation with Michael asking him to basically put things in context where where Lamar Hunt's uh, head was at, uh, his career was at in the late 1950s, circa 1957, actually, before he really even became sort of this saint, if you will, in professional sports. And here's how we started that conversation. Nineteen fifty-eight, Lamar Hunt is working at his father's oil company. His father was the legendary Texas billionaire H. L. Hunt, and Lamar was sort of the most mild-mannered, most introverted of of H. L. Hunt's sons, and was working rather aimlessly and rather dispassionately at Hunt Oil Company. Um, What he really was, was a serious, true believer sports fan. And he was down at the Southwest Conference basketball tournament in Houston uh, the week after Christmas in 1958. And before he went to one of the games, he was sitting in his hotel room on the foot of the bed, watching the 1958 NFL title game the legendary overtime game, a.k.a. the greatest game ever played, between the Colts and the Giants. And Lamar had always known he wanted to own a sports team. He was blessed with the, with the means to do that. But he couldn't decide whether it was baseball or football. But he said that sitting on that bed, watching that great overtime game, that clinched it. Football had been his first love. 
football was what he knew best, and he decided he wanted to own a football team. And he also recalled sitting there and thinking, and it plays so well on TV, <laughs> and not really appreciating how important that was at the time. So for much of 1959, Lamar tried to get a franchise, acquire a franchise, buy a franchise and move a franchise or get an expansion franchise in the NFL. But the 12 owners in the NFL had survived the depression. They'd survived um, the player shortage in world war two. They'd survived a challenge from the all American football conference. And they really were not interested in expanding. They really were not interested in sharing the pie they really were not interested in moving a franchise to Dallas. So um, they turned him down left and right. The only real opportunity he had to acquire a team was the Chicago Cardinals, who were the second team in the Chicago market, owned by a man, um, owned by uh, Walter Wolfner and Violet uh, Wolfner, who had been the, uh, been the widow of, of Charles Bidwell, the original Cardinals owner. And Lamar made several efforts to try to get the Cardinals, but Wolfner was not selling. Why, and at why, one point Michael, he said, why, why was, why was the Cardinals the highest on his list to pursue uh, versus be, other franchises? Because they, they were the only, they were sort of the, uh, the redheaded stepchild in Chicago. Cause you had the bears and the Cardinals competing for the Chicago market. Um, they were because of Bidwill's death. They did not belong to, football people per se. Um, and so they were, they were a team that could either move or be sold. And for the NFL, um, there was a real, uh, challenge with the Chicago market because with two Chicago teams, and remember this is at a time where home games were blacked out. There was always a Chicago team at home. And so they could never broadcast any games when either the Bears or Cardinals were playing that day. So the NFL really wasn't taking full advantage of the Chicago television market. Yeah. And so all of those factors made, if you were going to get a team, it was going to be Chicago. Yeah. And um, Lamar made several passes at that. Finally, he visited uh, Wolfner down in Miami where he had some horse racing concerns. And uh, Wolfner said, I, you know, I'm not going to sell. I'm not going to sell control. I've got all these people who are interested in a team. There's this guy, Bud Adams, who wants to buy down in Houston. There's a guy in Denver. There's some people in Minneapolis, but I'm, I'm just not going to sell. And so Lamar shook his hand, got on a, uh, got on a flight back to Dallas. And he said that on the plane flying back to Dallas, the light bulb went on in his head. And it was in essence, this, I want to have a new team. All these other people want to have a new team, but the NFL is not open to that. So why don't I simply start a new football league? Which you would have to be really young and really naive <laughs> and really audacious and also really um, well off to, to come up with that as a solution. But Lamar did. He was so, he was so energized by it. He, he asked the flight attendant for some stationery and uh, that stationery appears at the pro football hall of fame and in the chief's hall of honor. Now copies of that reproductions of that. He sketched out the idea for, for a new league on the flight from Miami back to Dallas. This is in, uh, in 1959. And then he spent the next several months just doing research on the feasibility of this asking around finding more information, tracking down the other likely investors. And in early August of 59, he announced that uh, this new league, which they would call the American Football League, would launch in the fall of 1960. And he then began recruiting other owners, Bud Adams in uh, Houston, Baron Hilton out in Los Angeles with the Chargers, franchise in, in Oakland, the... Uh, the franchise in Denver, which became the Broncos. And one of the charter franchises was, was in Minneapolis. Yeah. Let's and, talk, about, uh, let's, let's talk about Minneapolis for a second. Cause that's a very interesting story in and of itself because Max Winter obviously was part of the original 
cabal that uh, that 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 Hunt was sort of trying to get together, but it's also indicative of what the NFL basically started to do in sort of semi retaliation, if not outright. Oh, I I think you could call it outright retaliation. I think once the once the NFL owners realized just how serious this undertaking was, they immediately started sabotaging um, the efforts and they, they, they went through the front door and through the back door. Their efforts to go through the front door um, were simply that they, they made repeated offers to Lamar and Bud Adams and a handful of other owners that if they would um, drop this American Football League they would get expansion franchises in the NFL, which is, of course, what Lamar wanted in the first place. Um, but to his credit, he said if if he couldn't get all eight owners, he'd given them their word. If he couldn't get all eight owners in the new league in the NFL. He was he was not going to defect. So that failed. So then later in August, um, George Hallis and Art Rooney Sr. Um, at a press conference down in Houston where they were holding an exhibition game and announced that the NFL had decided to expand and uh, they were going to put franchises in, of all places, Dallas and Houston. (laughs) So that was not a coincidence. That was the NFL's declaration of war. The funding for the Houston franchise fell through, but the Dallas franchise was going strong. But Max Winter and before, Max we get, Win- Max before Winter we get to before we get to Minneapolis, oh, sure. there was one other uh, one other event that occurred, and that was in October of 1959. The commissioner of the NFL, Burt Bell, died of a heart attack while at a Philadelphia Eagles Pittsburgh Steelers game. So suddenly you had this uh, this sort of um, benign figure of Bell who had been very friendly with with Hunt and it it sort of served as an intermediary um, is now no longer on the scene. And there is this void at the top of the NFL because it takes them a a long time to find a new commissioner. And now everything is going on back channels. Um, George Hallis and some others are trying to manipulate the situation and essentially the kill the AFL in its infancy. So one of the things they do when the Houston franchise falls through is they reach out to Max Winter and the Minneapolis ownership group and essentially say, um, we are going to offer you an expansion franchise in the NFL. Um, If you don't take that offer, we are going to get somebody else to put a franchise in Minneapolis and you're going to be competing (laughs) with the with the NFL. And so the same weekend of the very first AFL draft held in November of 1959, um, the news comes out that Minnesota has secretly accepted this bid to be in the NFL. And the story has been told and embroidered and and um, augmented over the years. But the, the essence of the story is the the AFL owners are sitting in a conference room um, in in Minneapolis, and one of the owners, Harry Wismer of the New York Titans, mm-hmm. the uh, the very well known announcer, comes in with the next morning's newspaper, <laughs> and uh, announces to the other AFL owners that this is the Last Supper, and then he points to Max Winter and identifies Max Winter as Judas, <laughs> and then slams the newspaper down on the conference table. And suddenly the AFL is dealing with this, this signal betrayal. Um, Minneapolis indeed did defect to the NFL. Um, so Winter and his group wound up getting an expansion franchise in the NFL. Clint Murkison got the Dallas franchise in the NFL. And uh, the Dallas franchise started in 1960. The Minneapolis franchise started in 1961, and that was sort of the the body blow that the AFL took even before it had had been born to fill in the gap of the missing Minneapolis franchise. The AFL put a franchise in Oakland, which also offered Baron Hilton and the Chargers a natural rival and another West Coast team. So then suddenly the first year of the AFL had franchises in Los Angeles, 
Oakland, um, Denver, and Dallas. That was your Western division. And then Houston, Buffalo, New York, and Boston. That was your Eastern division. And uh, that was what the, the AFL was up against. And as we got through to the beginning of 1960, and this is where also Lamar shaped the future of pro football. The only way the league was really going to be able to survive was to get a TV deal. And the revolutionary thing that Lamar sketched out on the, uh, on the stationary in that flight in 1959 to Dallas was that rather than each of the eight teams going and negotiating its own TV deal, which was what was happening in the NFL at that time, the league itself would negotiate on behalf of all eight of its franchises to sign a joint television deal with a network. And that deal was negotiated by an agent for MCA, the talent agency, an agent for MCA named Jay Michaels. His son, Al, is Al Michaels of Sunday Night Football. There you go. Um, and that, and was with, uh, that was with and AB, that deal a, was that deal was, was, was negotiated with ABC, right. and that was a crucial deal because even in the first year of the contract, there were AFL teams that were starting from scratch, had never existed before, that were making more money in their TV deal than certain franchises in the NFL. So that was the key to getting the AFL off the ground. Was there any love loss between? I got to suspect there was between Hunt. And winter, since that winter was basically the the first sort of defector, uh, even before the league got off the ground. Well, I'm sure that Lamar um, held a bit of a grudge, um, but to his credit, and this is sort of typical of who he was, each team to buy a franchise in the AFL had to pay twenty five thousand um, dollars, but after. Minneapolis defected. Lamar thought that the gentlemanly thing to do was return the 25,000 for the Minneapolis franchise. Um, at the same time, um, I'll tell you later, which is sort of the end of this story about, uh, when Lamar saw Max winter 10 years later in the elevator before super bowl four, which coincidentally found, Lamar's team, the Kansas City Chiefs, who had moved from Dallas after the 62 season and were now the Kansas City Chiefs against Max Winner's team, the Minnesota Vikings in Super Bowl IV. That's a, uh, that's a great story. We will get back to that. Um, but you're now... Foresh foreshadowing. Foreshadowing, <laughs> foreboding, hopefully not. Um, but uh, it, it certainly was a fairly inauspicious start, right? I mean... It, you, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, the uh, one of the co-owners of the Raiders had uh, dubbed this sort of merry band of of men the Foolish Club uh, for the amount of money and the undertaking that they were about to uh, to pursue. Um, can you sort of give us a bit of a sense of how Hunt sort of kind of you know dealt with the immediate setback and and you know with ABC contract in hand uh, get this thing off the ground? Well, I, I think that it was actually a, a couple years down the line before uh, the Raiders co-owner Wayne Valley decided that the uh, the league should be known as the Foolish Club. But uh, of course, the the problem was you suddenly went from having twelve professional football teams to overnight the market for pro football nearly doubling. Suddenly, you had twenty one football pro football teams in nineteen sixty. The the uh, 12 in the AFL plus their expansion team that they added in Dallas and eight entirely new franchises in the AFL and um, the Dallas Texans Lamar's team, even though they had a, a great deal of money to sign players. And even though they had a very aggressive advertising campaign and an owner with deep pockets, which not all of the AFL teams had lost nearly a million dollars their first year. Um, Second year was, if anything, worse. Some teams suffered attendance declines. Um, and after that second year, uh, the owners were going around and talking about what they'd lost. And, you know, this franchise lost 600,000. I think the Texans lost 400,000. Another franchise lost a million. And uh, Valley was reputed to say, uh, you guys sound like you're proud of this. We, uh, we can't keep doing this. 
we should call ourselves the Foolish Club. And Lamar was was so pleased with that and uh, had that sort of Pollyanna mindset that uh, always, uh, when when given lemons, tried to tried to come up with lemonade. He uh, sent out a Christmas card the following year to all the owners uh, with a portrait of them um, and dubbed them the Foolish Club, and and the name stuck. Um, I think the a couple key things happened that allowed the AFL to survive. One of them was at the end of the 1962 season, the Dallas Texans, Lamar's team, played the Houston Oilers, who'd won the first two AFL titles in the 62 AFL title game. And they had an epic game, uh, which at that time was the longest pro football game ever played. It went to, went to the sixth quarter um, before the Texans won in a late field goal. That game was watched by something like 40 million people across the country. And it really was the AFL's coming of age as a football league. Um, shortly after that game, uh, in, which the, in which the Texans won, and so Lamar Hunt, who founded the league, finally had a, uh, finally had a champion, um, he made the very difficult decision to move the team from his hometown of Dallas to Kansas City. Um, but it was a, a crucial move because the Texans had been hemorrhaging money. They'd lost a million five their first two seasons in Dallas. And there was no real um, hope for a, a big change in the future. They'd lost half a million dollars even after winning the league title hmm. um, because they were competing with the established NFL. And the Cowboys also had deep pockets. And Dallas wasn't really a big enough market to support two pro football teams. So he moved the team to Kansas City, started making money his first season in Kansas City. Um, A year later, the New York Titans, which at that point was one of the shakiest, if not the shakiest franchise in the AFL, um, went into receivership. Harry Wismer couldn't really afford it. But Sonny Werblin of of MCA, um, who had been instrumental in help negotiating that first TV deal, Um, bought the Titans, took them out of receivership and injected them with a sort of first class ownership, marketing, um, business plan, moved the team into the new Shea Stadium where they averaged like 50,000 fans a year, (laughs) the year before Joe Namath arrived. (laughs) And then of course, Werblin famously um, signed Joe Namath to that eye popping $427,000 contract, which as the saying goes back in 1965 was a lot of money. Um, so that was important. It also allowed, um, the presence of Hunt in Kansas city and Werblin in New York with the renamed jets allowed the AFL to negotiate a huge TV deal, um, in 1964, with NBC that would actually uh, narrow the gap. By that point, NFL had its own joint deal with CBS and they just re-upped for, for a huge amount of money, like a million four per team per year. Um, but the AFL was able to negotiate a deal that got their teams nearly a million a year and put them closer to being on equal footing with the NFL. And it was after that deal that Art Rooney of the Steelers um, upon getting the news said to another NFL owner, well, they don't have to call us Mr. Anymore. Uh, it was at that point that it became clear that the AFL was, was in it to stay. And, um, one other point on this, I'm sorry, ask a question and, and you get a plot. No, I, I love it. So Keep going. Long-winded. This is great. Stuff. I don't mean to be so, so long winded in my I love answers, it. but I love all of it. The, the other thing that was, that was, I think, crucially important was the cities that the AFL went into, Buffalo, Denver, Houston, um, San Diego eventually, because after one year, the Los Angeles Chargers moved to San Diego, Oakland, Kansas City starting in 63. These were cities in many cases that did not have a Major League Baseball franchise. And they were starving to be considered major league. And pro football was one way that they were viewed as major league. And so what you see in in looking at a Denver, a San Diego, a Kansas City, a Buffalo, 
were were cities in which the teams developed a real loyal, strong following very early in in their existence, and that um, that helped build that connection between these new teams that were created out of whole cloth and and their fan base, and it 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 really solidified after a few years. Um, the AFL's ability to perform well at, at the box office. And so you, you began seeing sellout crowds in Kansas city. You began seeing sellout crowds in New York, in Denver. Um, and that also, in addition to the TV deal helped create this authentic chemistry, this authentic enthusiasm. And then you had this other aspect, which was that because the AFL just needed players, they were able to um, sort of be more aggressive, um, a little less conservative by nature. That meant that um, the game itself as it was played was more wide open. There was more passing, but it also meant that the players they brought in, um, there weren't these unwritten rules that limited uh, certain NFL teams to have fewer black players. They, aggressively went after players from historically black colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it, it was just this sense of the wild West, this great wide open, this sense of a pure meritocracy. If you could make it, you got your shot. And so you had a situation uh, in 63, the first player taken in the AFL draft was Junius Buck Buchanan. Um, they were in Dallas when that draft was held, but he would start his career um, when the franchise had moved to Kansas City. There were more African-American players. There was more passing. There was more wide open offense. You had these offensive masterminds, Sid Gilman, mm. sort of the, mo the, the father of the modern passing game. Sure. Hank Stram, who was one of the innovators in um, multiple offenses, a lot of pre-snap shifts in motion. Al Davis. Um, and his notorious long passing game in Oakland, all of these things were going on at a time where the NFL was still very meat and potatoes, Vince Lombardi, three yards and a cloud, a cloud of, of dust, dust, a power sweep. Um, there was a real difference in the sort of game that was played in the AFL and the sort of game that was played in the NFL. And the old line people in the NFL said, well, there's no defense in the AFL. They sort of looked down their nose on it. But the AFL played a very entertaining brand of football and fans and uh, not just in the cities, but uh, fans on TV across the country grew to, grew to love that game. Do you, do you uh, Michael, do you have any, uh, uh, any sense as to why uh, Kansas City was the place uh, Lamar Hunt decided to move Dallas the Dallas franchise too. Well, there were, there were a couple of reasons. Um, one of them was that Kansas city pursued Dallas, uh, very aggressively. The mayor H row Bartle, whose nickname by the way, was chief, um, sort of reached out to Lamar right after the 62 AFL title game, um, invited him up to Kansas city said, uh, we'll, We'll start our, our Chamber of Commerce. will help start this season ticket drive. You can play a municipal stadium. Um, you will, you will, we will build you a practice facility in, uh, in Swope Park. And you guys, you guys will, will start on the good foot. And you won't have to compete with another pro football franchise. That was one reason. The other reason, though, um, that I spent some time writing about in in both America's game and in my biography of Lamar Hunt was that um, New Orleans, which had reached out to um, Lamar earlier, New Orleans could not get a stadium deal. There were still problems with um, facilities being segregated in New Orleans. And so Kansas city made the more aggressive, uh, more viable offer and Lamar decided to move the franchise to Kansas city. Um, and they already had just moving to Kansas city their first year in 63, they had a greater season ticket base than anybody else in the AFL had had, even though, um, the AFL had, 
at, at a three year head start. So Kansas City was very, very aggressive um, about getting the team that um, was renamed to the Chiefs, partly after H. Row Bartle. Although um, Lamar, having seen uh, having seen the Minneapolis Lakers move out to Los Angeles and keep their name was originally very, very determined that the uh, the team would keep its nickname and therefore be the Kansas City Texans. Um, to his credit, Lamar's general manager, Jack Stedman, uh, who was not really a football guy, was more of a business guy, an oil guy, did have the good sense to somewhat sternly and somewhat stubbornly um, tell Lamar, you cannot move a franchise to Kansas City, Missouri, and call it the Kansas City Texans. So they, they had a newspaper name that team contest and uh, the Kansas City Chiefs became the uh, became the, the new nickname for the franchise. That's that's, that's a hard to believe story. It's uh, it's incredible. I, I, you wonder what was in his head when he was, you know, thinking about the moves to actually keep the name and, and to be have to be talked out of it. He loved he loved being from Texas and, he you know, he'd, he'd gotten into football in the first place because he had he was a Texan who loved football. And he sort of had this thought that maybe it would, maybe it would go. He even Lamar it would admit later that he was foolish and he was being stubborn, and and renaming the team was the very much the right thing to do. So you know, come forty, uh, come nineteen sixty four, sixty five. You're talking about now. I guess there was a new tel- television contract, and and the bidding wars kind of really started to sort of percolate uh, in terms of. Uh, player salaries and, and the like, and it seemed like they you know, the AFL was really not only on the rise, but but potentially a a major irritant to the NFL now uh, after a couple of years under its belt. No, I think there's no question about that, and I think that um, it's hard to overstate how much intrigue, how much animosity, how much behind the scenes spy versus spy type machinations were going on between the NFL and the AFL. You know, the two leagues had sort of, they sort of had this unwritten rule that they were not going to raid the other league for veteran players. So the battlefield was for players coming out of college rookies. And so both leagues would hold drafts and then it was great for the rookie football players because they were, um, benefited from this bidding war and both leagues went to extreme measures to try to induce players to come to their league. And this involved not just money. It involved, um, women, alcohol, whatever it took by any means necessary. Um, when tech Schramm, the uh, president of the Dallas Cowboys Uh, referred later in his life to the war in the 60s, he was not referring to Vietnam. He was referring to the battle between the National Football League and the American Football League. It got so elaborate at some point, at one point, that the NFL had a, uh, a initiative that they referred to as Operation Handholding also known as um, babysitters. And what they would do is they would go out and recruit Um, incoming rookies before the draft, try to build a relationship with these rookies, and then they would swoop down um, the weekend of the draft and try to keep these players away from whoever the AFL representative was and get them to sign a deal before they could really even hear the pitch from the AFL. And the AFL responded with its own countermeasures at, at, uh, at one point in the middle of the decade, the NFL was holding this um, sort of for show draft at a hotel in New York with the press there, with, with, play, with team representatives there. But at another hotel, they were holding a secret draft behind closed doors and then telephoning the results of that draft to the show draft that the media was at. And it was, it was that kind of very Machiavellian environment in which the two leagues were, were operating and spending a great deal of money. And I think that it, it, it's really ironic because um, 
you had interest in the two leagues increasing because you had this 12 month a year battle between the AFL and the NFL. On the other hand, the money that they were spending was threatening the very existence of teams in both leagues. <laughs> um, the chargers were in trouble. The Cardinals were in trouble. The Steelers were in trouble. Uh, the Raiders had to be bailed out at one point by, uh, by Ralph Wilson, the owner of the bills just to make their payroll and stay alive. So it was a, uh, it was a very difficult situation. And finally, early 1966 Tex Schramm of the Cowboys who really disliked Lamar partially because they were for the first three seasons, both operating in the same market decided that it, it had come time to try to reach a truce. So Tex reached out to his old friend, Pete Rosell, the commissioner of the NFL and Rosell told him that he could, he could make uh he could make an effort to try to broker a deal. And uh, Schramm called Lamar Hunt, asked him if they could have a meeting. Lamar was in Kansas City at the time, working on a uh, season ticket drive. But he had to be down in Texas for, a, for an AFL owners meeting. And he flew into Dallas, got off the plane at Love Field. And he and Tex had this secret meeting spot um, under the statue of the Texas Ranger in the lobby of uh, Dallas Love Field Airport. And uh, Schramm was there to meet him. They went out and sat in Schramm's car. And that was when, this is April of 66, Schramm um, said we would be, under certain circumstances, interested in discussing a merger between the two leagues. And uh, for the next two months, Schramm representing the NFL and Lamar representing the AFL carried on these secret negotiations, which um, ultimately led to the June 8, 1966 announcement that the NFL and the AFL were going to merge. And that following that 1966 season, uh, the two leagues were going to play a championship game. Um, the AFL NFL championship game at a site to be determined. And it's again, if you, if you grew up after that time, it, it's hard to describe just how much of an unknown quantity that was because no AFL team had ever played practiced against, um, taken the same field, even scrimmaged against an NFL team. But after that 66 season, you had that first game uh, where an NFL team, the NFL champion, was going to take the field against the AFL champion. Um, and that game would come to be known, of course, as the Super Bowl. And it was Lamar, um, he's credited correctly so for giving um, the name to that game. But I think the thing that's, that's lost there is if it wasn't for Lamar and the AFL, there there wouldn't have been such a game because there wouldn't have been two leagues um, vying for the public dollar and public interest. Well, you tell an anecdote in there about how, how the name Super Bowl probably came about, right? From Lamar's family. Yeah. Lamar's, uh, Lamar's kids had, uh, you know, the, the big, the big item at that, uh, at that time in American popular culture was the whammo Super Bowl. And uh, Lamar's children each got a uh, got a Super Bowl in that summer of 1966, and uh, Lamar wrote a note to Pete Rozelle, in which he said, "I think we should coin a phrase for for this game. We should come up with a uh, we should come up with a catchy title, um, such as." And he suggested. Super Bowl. Um, and he sort of said it to Roselle apologetically um, in this letter. And, and he allowed that he was sure that um, this committee on the merger could come up with a better name than that. Um, but Super Bowl, of course, stuck. And that was what, even before the NFL started officially calling the game the Super Bowl, that was the name 
that newspaper headline writers started calling it. Roselle didn't like the name. Roselle thought the name was unsophisticated and had this golly gee whiz air to it. Um, but even within NFL circles, when NFL films um, did their first roll of film at that first AFL NFL championship game, um, the sound man said Super Bowl real one. <laughs> so it, it, it had it sort of gotten this momentum on its own. Finally, by the time the third game was played, um, Roselle surrendered because everybody was calling it Super Bowl. So there was no reason at that point not to adopt the name officially. So uh, before we uh, go into the later years of the AFL and NFL's merger slash coexistence, um, I, I want to go back to that sort of pivotal moment. I mean, you, you mentioned Shram kind of uh, being sort of the um, the go to, I guess, in, in in reaching out to to hunt uh, is. Do you have any sense of, of whose idea that that really was at the beginning? What was was he doing Roselle's bidding? Was it Shram's kind of insistence or, or recognition? Uh, you know, did Hunt even maybe make some some uh, well, uh, entreaties well, here, over the way? You know, there had been there had been discussions of mergers um, since really since the AFL started, but the NFL was was in the stronger position. There had been some. Um, discussions between Carol Rosenblum and some AFL owners a year earlier that led to nothing because at the time the NFL's sort of private position was if we do merge, um, we are not going to take in the teams from um, for, with, with two markets so that the Jets, the Jets would not be able to stay in New York if there was going to be a merger. The Raiders would not be able to stay in the in the Bay area, if there was going to be a merger by 66, when Shram, um, negotiated the deal, it became clear. Um, and this was not Shram's choosing, but it became clear that if the league was going, if the two leagues were going to merge and, um, survive any antitrust challenges that you were not going to be able to move the jets, who by then had Namath and were already um, challenging the Giants in popularity in that very big market. Mm. And the Raiders, who under Al Davis had sort of established um, their own identity in the Bay Area market, you were not going to get those franchises to move. So then, as the negotiation was going on, what Shram had to do was try to convince um, the San Francisco ownership and the New York Giants ownership to find some way to agree to this deal. Now, by the time we get to 66, Al Davis has been hired as the commissioner of the American Football League. The Giants have signed, for the first time ever, a veteran player from the other league, the kicker, Pete Gogolak. Mm -hmm. And that prompts Al Davis to direct this guerrilla war in which he starts trying to sign quarterbacks from the other league. So Roman Gabriel um, signs a contract with the Raiders. John Brody, the 49ers quarterback, signs this huge contract, which was written up literally on the back of a cocktail napkin <laughs> with the Oilers. So as this negotiation is going on and intensifying, the Giants, in response to the Jets having gotten Namath and being successful there, they say they want either the first pick in the draft or the ability to trade that pick for an established quarterback. The 49ers say they just want their damn quarterback, John Brody, back. <laughs> and those are part of the those are part of the agreements to bring about the AFL NFL merger. There is a uh, there is a fee for the AFL franchises, but Lamar negotiates that the fee is amortized out over a number of years, and he has to talk the AFL owners into doing that. But Lamar um, very smartly recognizes that the value and the TV money for the AFL teams, the value is instantly going to increase. The TV money is going to quickly increase. Once the two leagues merge completely with the 1970 season, 
And so they negotiate and bring about this deal. And uh, there is a very famous press conference with Roselle in the center, Lamar on one side, Schramm on the other side in June of 1966 in New York, where the merger is announced. And then, of course, you've got to get approval of this through Congress. And the key factor in gaining that approval is uh, Russell Long from Louisiana um, needs an assurance that there's going to be an expansion franchise in New Orleans. And there is a quid pro quo that is pushed through. Long is able to get um, approval and antitrust protection for the merger of the two leagues in this bill, pulling an end around um, from the representative Emmanuel Seller, who was, um, who was opposed to it. And New Orleans gets its franchise. The NFL and the AFL merger is approved. And on January 15, 1967, the Green Bay Packers, champions of the NFL, take the field at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum against the Kansas City Chiefs, the champions of the AFL, um, in the very first Super Bowl. And uh, what was interesting about, one of the many things that was interesting about that game was in terms of the public interest for the game, they were, they were fascinated with it, but it was a foregone conclusion that the Packers were going to dominate because they were from the more established league. They were Vince Lombardi coached. They had, they had the best known team. They had won titles in the NFL now for two years running. Um, it was sort of universally understood that the NFL was going to have the better league for certainly for the time being. But at the same time, within the leagues themselves, there was a tremendous amount of tension and pressure. Frank Gifford, um, who by then was an announcer for CBS, said that down on the field in the minutes before Super Bowl one, as he was doing a pregame interview with Lombardi, Lombardi was trembling because everything that Lombardi had accomplished with the Packers in the NFL would be for naught if they couldn't beat the upstart new league in that first Super Bowl. Everything to lose. And after, yeah, every, after that tough first half in which the Chiefs actually outgained the Packers and the score was close, 14 to 10, the, uh, the Packers broke through in the second half, won the game 35 to 10, and the next day at the NFL meetings, when Lombardi walked in with the Packers ownership group, the other owners at the NFL stood up and gave Lombardi a standing ovation. <laughs> Wellington Mara, the owner of the Giants, said that the, the mood for the first mixed party with owners from the AFL and NFL together um, that weekend, um, that the, the atmosphere at that was was something akin to that aboard the USS Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was, there, was, there was some real tension, there was some genuine animosity, and there was some real pressure because those two, those two leagues had not, had not played before that first game. Well, um, I was going to say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, you know, in, in those latter years, right, 68 through 70 until, the, until it was a fully accomplished merger, you, you had a couple of years there where you had, you know, the leagues were essentially in parallel and sort of different sort of universes, yet they're conjoined by official merger agreement, right? By the Super Bowl. And they played, they played some preseason games. And, um, you know, the Chiefs, after they were, after they'd lost that first Super Bowl, um, were sort of the the butt of a lot of jokes, a little bit like what happened to the Buffalo Bills when sure. they lost four Super Bowls in a row, a little, bit, a little bit like what happened to the Denver Broncos when they got blown out by the 49ers in the Super Bowl. The Chiefs, in going into that 67 season, were, were roundly derided as the best of a Mickey Mouse league. But they had a preseason game that next summer, summer of 67, 
in Kansas City against the Chicago Bears, who were still coached by George Hallis, the very embodiment of the NFL. And that preseason game, the Chiefs just slaughtered the Bears. The score was 66 to 24. Um, Dick Butkus at, in the fourth quarter of that game um, famously said to Len Dawson across the line of scrimmage, hey, let up. Um, not worried about me, but you're going to kill that horse you've got. Because the Chiefs had a, had a horse war paint that ran around the field after every touchdown. And uh, by the time the score got up into the 60s, war paint had a pretty serious workout. There are, there are Chiefs players I talked to um, as I was um, researching the book America's Game because the Chiefs were one of the six franchises I focused on in that book who said that of all their wins, Super Bowl IV, um, winning the AFL title in 66, winning the AFL title in 62, beating the Raiders to go to Super Bowl IV, that of all their wins, maybe that win over the Bears was in a way the most satisfying, even though it was an exhibition game, because it sort of staked this claim to, hey, we can play some football as well with this, with this NFL franchise that was pretty decent, had Gale Sayers, Dick Butkus, was a credible franchise and just wiped them off the field. And then uh, obviously the 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 equal the equal the equality basically kicked in on, on Super Bowl three. We all know the Joe Namath, uh, you know, legacy uh, prediction of that game. Um, but you know, it, it seems to me that the uh, the AFL truly um, didn't go out with a whimper. They you know essentially lived on. Uh, as the merger finally um, uh, came together, I mean, it, you literally had a conference essentially that uh, in the in modern day NFL uh, was the result of the AFL's uh, original team setup. Yeah, and you, you you have to go back and 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 spend a little time talking about how important Super Bowl three and Super Bowl four were, because. I didn't know this when I started working on America's game, but in my research, I saw that the weekend before Super Bowl three was played down in Miami Colts and jets Roselle at his annual state of the league press conference said that after Super Bowl four, they might change the format so that two NFL teams could play in the Super Bowl because the conventional wisdom at the time was that it was going to be another decade before the AFL was going to be able to be on par with the NFL. Interesting. The Packers, the Packers had won both of the first two Super Bowls going away. The Colts were like a 17 to 19 point favorite over the Jets going into Super Bowl three. And so the feeling was these Super Bowls weren't going to be very competitive for a while. Then, of course, Namath, the league's biggest star from the nation's biggest city, goes on the biggest stage and predicts and then delivers the biggest upset in pro football history. Um, there were people who were in shock after that third Super Bowl, people who not just with the Colts, but people with the league who needed to be consoled, who were in tears. Um, and I think it's significant as I went back and read the uh, newspapers and magazines from that period, that going into Super Bowl IV, there were a lot of NFL loyalists who still didn't take the AFL seriously, who said that um, if the Jets and Colts had played 10 times the Colts were going to win nine of those games and who, because of that felt as though the Vikings were going to slaughter the chiefs. The Vikings were two touchdown plus favorites over the chiefs in super bowl four, which brings us back to Lamar and Max winter. As we start, um, as we start tying this up, good callback, um, very good callback. They were, they were at the same hotel. And, um, so Lamar and his wife, Norma, um, we're kind of late getting started to, to get to Tulane Stadium for the Super Bowl. They stopped in their room. They'd had some breakfast, luncheon. 
They stopped in their room, got all they needed, got their coats, and they get on the elevator. And as the elevator doors open and they get on, there's only two other people on the elevator. And it's Max Winter and his wife, the Vikings owner, co-owner, and his wife. And Lamar and Norma politely say hello to Max Winter and his wife, and they politely say hello back. And then they ride down to the lobby in silence. As they get off the lobby, the winters go one way, the hunts go the other way. As they're walking out to their car, Lamar says to Norma, we're going to win today. And Norma's eyes widen and she looks back at him and she says, how do you know? And Lamar says, because they're even scareder than we are. (laughs) He sensed how nervous and how tense and how uptight Winter was uh, as the Vikings owner. And of course, the Chiefs go out. They thoroughly dominate the Vikings. They win 23 to 7 with a team that is the very epitome of the AFL, uh, the first team in pro football in which a majority of the starters were African-American, a team that is reflective of the innovation um, that Hank Stram brought uh, with lots of different formations, lots of pre-snap motion against Bud Grant, whose team, I believe, had no motion, no pre-snap shifts, and used only two formations the entire game. Um, You get sort of the offense of the 60s as represented by the Vikings against the offense of the future as represented by the Chiefs. And they go out and they win. And now after four Super Bowls, the NFL has won two, the AFL has won two, and they are on equal footing. And the American Football League at that point finally gets the respect that it's due. And at that same moment, the league ceases to exist because with the next season, 1970, you've got the full and complete merger. The AFL uh, is no longer an entity. It's renamed the American football conference. It brings over three new teams. So instead of a 16 team NFL and a 10 team AFL, you have two 13 team conferences, the national football conference and the American football conference within the larger umbrella of the National Football League. Um, And so the AFL is no more. And yet, what Lamar Hunt accomplished with the AFL was the, the first upstart league in American professional team sports to survive intact since the American League of Baseball Clubs started in 1901. So... Since 1901, the only upstart league in American professional team sports that has survived intact to challenge a more established league is the AFL. And all eight franchises of the AFL survive today. And in fact, the four teams of the AFL West Division, that the four franchises that competed against each other in 1960, the Texans, who are now the Chiefs, the Chargers, the Raiders, the Broncos, that division has remained, those four teams have remained division rivals every year since 1960. And the AFC Trophy is named after Lamar Hunt himself. And the AFC Championship Trophy is named after Lamar Hunt it's himself. And the Kansas City Chiefs, the team that Lamar owned and is now owned by his children, have not ever won the Lamar Hunt Trophy. And uh, as I was working on America's Game, and I was talking to then the Chiefs GM, Carl Peterson, and the Chiefs coach, Dick Vermeil, as Lamar was aging, um, they would have tears in their eyes when they talked about how much they wanted to win the Lamar Hunt Trophy and give that to the man it was named after. Um, you know, we've we, we've we've seen a lot of um, championship droughts end. We've seen LeBron James bring a title to Cleveland. Um, we've of course seen the Cubs 
and the curse of the billy goat um and oh, yeah. both of those uh both of those were long droughts um it's not quite as long but it's going to be pretty emotional the next time the Kansas City Chiefs get back to the Super Bowl and uh in so doing win the AFC title and Clark Hunt um gets to raise the trophy named after his father that's going to be a special moment for for a lot of people um, from Kansas City. And it will, you know, the Chiefs still um, take the field wearing a patch with the old AFL logo on it, um, similar to the patch that the Chiefs wore in Super Bowl IV, honoring the 10-year anniversary of the AFL. A couple of quick questions, Michael, before we, we wrap it up. I, and I can't thank you enough because this, these have been fantastic stories about not only the AFL, but Hunt himself. I, I guess the one question sorry, I would sort of sorry to lay sorry to lay the filibuster on you. It's, be, it's the, gone no, on. But, I, my hope yeah, is that the, my hope is that, that our listeners, and I'm sure they'll be a small in number to start, but hopefully grow over time and persistently uh, will be discovered. Uh, we'll will find this all very fascinating and hopefully uh, seek to find out more. Not only in uh, the book Lamar Hunt: A Life in Sports, which you wrote in t- 2012, uh, but also the uh, the other book that you've referenced a couple of times. Uh, during the course of this America's game, the epic story of how pro football captured a nation uh, from 2004. Uh, I would highly urge all of my uh, listeners to to get both of those books because, uh, and I have not read, I, I have to confess, I have not read America's game, but I have read, read the Hunt book uh, thoroughly. Um, we are only scratching the surface. There's just an amazing amount of meticulous research uh, and stories and anecdotes and and just inside pieces of information that are just I think fascinating to anybody who's interested in sports history, but but Hunt in particular in the AFL. I'm curious. Well, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I I'm curious as to how you thought. How do how do you think Hunt balanced uh, this sort of dual uh, process of of running a team in a fledgling league, as well as oh yeah, by the way, running the fledgling league itself. Um, not an easy task, is it? Well, he always he always tried to do what was best for the league. And he, uh, he tended to think in terms of, and, you know, certainly this was the case with, with moving the franchise from Dallas to Kansas city. Certainly hunt himself had the money, had the wherewithal to afford losing a half million or a million dollars for many, many years in Dallas, but he recognized that the league was only as strong as its weakest franchise. And to have a team that was the sort of the second team, the second football team in a two football team market was not going to be good for the league, for the league standing, um, for the league's prestige. And so he made that sacrifice and moved the team to Kansas city um, to the eternal betterment of the of the city of Kansas city, Missouri. Um, so I think that was, that was important. He recognized that for the league to succeed, it needed to have eight strong franchises and he worked to make that happen. And he certainly welcomed and recognized very soon that Sonny Werblin was going to do the same thing in, in New York, turning a weak franchise into a much stronger one, um, by, uh, by taking over the Titans and, um, in the process, renaming them the Jets. Do you do you ever think that Hunt really kind of knew that this was ultimately going to happen if he just stuck to it and and got this league sort of a, to a, a viable, if not competitive, level with the NFL? Did he kind of see that vision that that ultimately this kind of uh, you know uh, merger and 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 an outcome would would happen? I think so. I also think Hunt was deceptively tough. He was very mild mannered. He was very polite, very affable. And I think some of the NFL owners took that as a sign of weakness or softness, just sort of saw him as this callow youth. But he was determined to succeed. And he was a principled man. You know, he had a chance, as I said earlier, to get what he'd wanted in the first place, which was an expansion NFL franchise in Dallas. But by that time, he'd started the AFL. He'd made a commitment to the other seven owners of the AFL. And so he stood his ground. And because of that, pro football was able to expand rapidly. 
and interest in pro football expanded rapidly. Um, a lot of other innovations that the AFL brought to the fore are part of the game today. Um, names on the backs of players' jerseys started in the American Football League. The two-point conversion famously started in the American Football League. Sure. Um, those innovations um, were significant and, and helped make the game more watchable in the 60s. And by the end of the 60s, um, pro football had eclipsed baseball and had become America's most popular sport. That would not have happened as quickly. It, it, it certainly was probably going to happen, but it no question would not have happened as quickly if it wasn't for Lamar Hunt starting the AFL. And last question would be, what were your impressions in all your research, both in both of these books, about Hunt before your research and your writing and, and afterwards? Was there something that you were unaware of or that, that became, you know, related to you or you discovered or, or maybe changed your opinion about the man uh, from what maybe you thought he was before the process of this book and this, this research began? I think the big thing was seeing the resilience, seeing the persistence, seeing the tenacity. Um, when he set his mind to something, he was highly determined and he just was not going to give up easily. And that sense of determination was crucial to the AFL's survival. The other thing on a more personal level was, you know, they say certain people are most at home when they're with their family. Certain people are most at home, most comfortable when they're alone. I always got the sense that Lamar um, felt uncomfortable about being the son of the richest man in the world, um, was certainly an inversion of every stereotype of what a rich Texas oil billionaire would be. He didn't go for the 10 gallon hats. He didn't go for the big belt buckles. He didn't go for, for all the bluster. Um, I felt like Lamar was most comfortable when he was just another face in the crowd at a sports event. And he loved going to you know, there are stories of, of him, not just in football, but baseball, hockey, soccer, which was his second love, going, getting on a plane and flying halfway across the country just to see a game. Um, he once, uh, on a weekend when he was courting his wife, Norma, they saw five football games in one weekend. One yep. Friday night at the Cotton Bowl, SMU Navy. Saturday at the Cotton Bowl, Texas OU. Then they went and saw a game Saturday night down in Waco, Baylor, Arkansas. Flew up to Kansas City and saw the Chiefs play on a Sunday. Flew back down to his hometown of Dallas and saw a game between historically black colleges and universities, Prairie View A&M and another school on Monday night. And as they were coming home from that, he said to Norma, we saw a fipple header this weekend. <laughs> Lamar loved being in the crowd and loved watching games. And she was probably canonized as a saint the following weekend, if I'm not mistaken. And, and Norma, I believe, is still the only woman who's been to each and every Super Bowl. I think she holds her, her streak. She loves sports as well. I, I can't imagine she had a choice by marrying into the, the Hunt family and Lamar. Uh, Michael, well, I think one of the things that caused him to fall in love with her was she already loved sports. So that was important. So no conversion necessary. Um, right. So, uh, Michael, I got to I got to thank you. And, and I, I uh, reserve the right to um, uh, to try uh, the second half of the story on the soccer front, because I think there's a whole bunch of very interesting and probably even less known stories about. Uh, Lamar's interest in 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 soccer, especially the old North American Soccer League, hopefully for another day. Um, but I do want to remind our listeners that um, 
uh, there, there are two specific books here. And, and again, Michael McCambridge uh, has been the guest, but he's he's also a prolific writer. He's r- written a lot of uh, very interesting books in and around the uh, uh, the sports history uh, genre. But America's Game, uh, his 2004 book called uh, America's Game, the epic story of how pro football captured a nation, um, essentially is is kind of a, a almost a, a treasure trove of, of history about how uh, and you heard some elements in this in this conversation. Pro football became what pro football is today, um, and there's no doubt that the um, the 2012 book uh, Lamar Hunt: A Life in Sports is uh, a deep dive, and I think, frankly, the the um, uh, essential read about the the life and times of of this man who essentially helped uh, birth not only the AFL but, frankly, modern day football uh, himself. And now that that said, Michael, I do have to sort of regale you one little piece of trivia from my end. Um, okay. not that, not that, it. It, not that it matters to you, but, um, you are backhandedly the inspiration for this podcast, uh, which I know you, you, you now have to be sitting down to take, but, um, <laughs> the, um, so 10 years ago, I, I started to sort of rattle around in my brain what, um, I could do to sort of scratch this itch about teams and leagues and, and defunctness, if you will, in sports. And the book that I saw in the bookstore uh, that's that just spoke to me, uh, which is a, also a fine book uh, authored by our our guest Michael McCambridge called the ESPN College Football Encyclopedia. Um, and if you've ever stumbled across this book, um, it is it's just it's the Bible, I guess, right of of college football. Um, it's it's statistics, but it's also well designed and laid out. Um, and I actually reached out to a woman by the name of you may not know her, Ellen Scordato. Uh, at so- at oh, Stone, yeah. she Stone Song Press. the book. She's wonderful. Correct. And I, um, you know, here I was just this little advertising uh, uh, executive, you know, in New York on a regular basis doing my sort of professional thing. And I uh, I made contact with Ellen and I sort of regaled to her, her with this idea of like, you know, there should be an encyclopedia for all these great teams and leagues and stories and vignettes, et cetera, helmets and, you know, color swatches and all that kind of stuff. And And I still hold on to that dream someday, but Ten years on, I just think that uh, the quickest way to start getting some of these stories out now is is in the audio uh, uh, method. But um, you know, I, 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 your your work on that book uh, is uh, is inspirational, I think, for for a lot of folks, and it's it continues to be, I think, one of probably the the best sort of I don't even want to call it a reference book, but um, it, it is very Bible like in its uh, uh, in its uh, over, uh, oversight of uh, the college football genre and. Um, you know, it, it does uh, have a lasting effect, and I think, um, you know, perhaps someday. Well, thank I, you. Yeah. Well, I thank you for the inspiration. I, ironically, I think I think that there will probably not anytime soon be another book like that because it was um, it was published just at the point that um, people were starting to get that information on the internet, and more of that information was becoming available on the internet. So there's not really a financial model for publishing a 1600 page book with 25 different writers and a cast of thousands of designers and statisticians. And that was kind of, um, you know, the last chopper out of Saigon (laughs) for big sports reference books um, for the time being. But I was, uh, I was very proud of that. And I think that, um, that book still holds up well. I wanted that book uh, as when I pitched it to ESPN, um, I said, nobody has done a, a good college football encyclopedia in decades and decades. And I want to do this differently. I want this to be a reference book that people will actually want to sit down and read. And I think that um, we succeeded on those terms. It holds up. And, um, you know, I, I, I highly Thank encourage you. anybody to uh, who's a big college football fan should uh, put that on their uh, library shelf and, uh, and and keep that and savor it because it's it's fantastic work. But um, n- no less, uh, uh, you know, uh, a um, denigration for any of your other work. And, and, and I can't thank you enough for uh, your time and, and, and regaling us with some stories about um, the AFL, Lamar Hunt. And, um, I, you know, uh, I'll keep my fingers crossed that we could do it again sometime. Would love to, and good luck with the podcast. I will certainly let you know how it goes and let you know when we're when it's up and running and um, give it a couple of weeks. And um, I look forward to socializing it and sharing it and hopefully getting you a few, um, a few more uh, library um, 
uh, purchases, you know, from the back library, as well as uh, maybe your current <laughs> book, too, about Chuck Knoll. You want to tell us one second about Chuck Knoll, um, the, the book that you wrote about him, which is currently out? Yeah, the uh, the most recent book is called um, Chuck Knoll, His Life's Work. It's available at uh, on Amazon and at finer bookstores near you, if there are any bookstores left near you. Um, <laughs> and it came out um, in the fall of 2016. Um, and it will be out in uh, the paperback version will be out in the fall of 2017. But I, uh, I spent uh, three years writing about the life of one of pro football's most successful coaches and, but also one of the, one of the least known giants in the, uh, in, in football in the past 50 years. So it was a, uh, it was a fascinating, uh, challenging process, but I enjoyed it. And you also did quickly mention uh, something in email that you may have something around 1970s sports maybe rattling around your brain. Maybe. Um, still haven't figured out what's coming next. At some point uh, in the future, I will, I believe, write a book about um, how the decade of the 70s transformed sports in American culture. Um, I don't know if I'm ready to undertake that just yet have some other uh, irons in the fire and, and trying to figure out what to do next. But at some point I, I do hope to write that book. I do know a podcast. And that, that book be- is, and that book is all about, um, you know, there's a lot in, in that book that would be about upstart leagues and the ABA and the world hockey association and world team tennis and the international volleyball association and all of those various and sundry fly by night outfits, including the world football league. Oh yes. Um, and the notion that there was a uh, there was a time in American history where it seemed entirely logical for someone launching a new football league to have a uh, pigskin in the shade of butterscotch with burnt orange stripes. <laughs> there was there was a week in ni- in the 1970s where that seemed like a logical thing to do. So that was a that was certainly an interesting decade in in. Uh, in American history and certainly in American sports be, history. Be careful. Gary Davidson is still with us and I, I intend to get him on this podcast and you have stumbled into my thicket. So I, uh, I can't wait to talk <laughs> to you about that book, maybe during the process as well. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Michael. I look forward to it. Thanks much. Take care, Michael. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Okay, so there is our conversation with uh, with Michael McCambridge, and uh, probably a little bit more than you wanted to know. Uh, the sort of backhanded, ironic inspiration, I guess, for this podcast uh, from one of his works, uh, and that work uh, which we just uh, talked about uh, is still out there, and it is um, uh, a really cool presentation of of sports information. The ESPN College Football Encyclopedia. Uh, I know that there are copies of that still out there, and um, it's a great reference piece, and it's uh, it doesn't feel like a reference piece. It's uh, it's something that you can uh, look at and go to on a on a regular basis, and perhaps someday, knock on wood, uh, we'll try to put something similar to that for our realm of defunct sports franchises and leagues and teams. Perhaps from some of the stories that we elicit in this podcast, uh, someday down the road, perhaps we can convince Michael if he's not retired and uh, living on a beach somewhere uh, to maybe help us in that effort. But in the meantime. I do, besides that book, recommend highly uh, two of the books that were referenced during the course of our conversation. Uh, One, again, is uh, Lamar Hunt, A Life in Sports. Uh, That's uh, published by Andrews McMeal. It came out in 2012. And then uh, by uh, in 2004, uh, his book, America's Game, The Epic Story of How Pro Football Captured a Nation, uh, which is published by Random House. Michael also uh, has uh, a book currently out on uh, the uh, life and times of legendary Pittsburgh Steelers uh, head coach Chuck Knoll. It's called Chuck Knoll, His Life's Work. Uh, That came out in October of 2016. All of those books available wherever fine publications are sold, Amazon and the like. Uh, We have a link to those uh, works uh, and others available at our website, which as a reminder is goodseatsstillavailable.com. Please follow us on uh, social media and uh, let other people know that uh, you like uh, what you're hearing. Uh, maybe they can check it out as well. Uh, on Twitter, that's at Good Seats Still. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. 
Uh, we also have a Facebook page uh, about Good Seats still available as well and um, all that good stuff. Uh, so thank you again for listening. We uh, look forward to many, many more uh, interesting and, and fascinating conversations coming up. So you have plenty to look forward to and we thank you for listening and we'll uh, see you on the, uh, the next show. Take care. Bye-bye.